again this week is a very, very important question to ask ourselves. How exactly, how exactly does God's grace change me or change a person? We hear that God's grace changes. That's fine. But how is that different than any other discipline in my life or a talent or a skill that I develop? How does the grace of God change? So we're going to talk about in three Three different, we're going to unfold this in three different ways. We're going to unfold that. Number one is, who needs God's grace? How do I get God's grace? And then how do I keep God's grace? So the first one, who needs God's grace? And I would agree, a lot of people don't feel a need for God's grace. And it really depends on what your definition or what your standard of greatness is. This has been an evolution in my own life. When I grew up, I had... I had the privilege of going to a very uh, strange school. I went to an embassy school in the capital uh, of Brazil. And in my school were kids of very powerful and wealthy people. My dad was a very small pastor, very small church pastor, and we were very poor. I don't, today there's not a car that says poverty. Any car is a nice car today. But in the 70s, a car that said poverty was the Ford Pinto. If you drove the Ford Pinto or the Pacer, one or the other, people said, oh, at least they can afford a car. That's good. <laughs> because you were, you were one step away from a horse and wagon. <laughs> that's kind of where it was. And that's what we drove. We had one old one. We couldn't even buy it new. We only drove one. Meanwhile, my friends at school are being chauffeured by their own personal valets and uh, uh, connoisseurs and all those kinds of things. So they, they would go, and I just remember thinking, oh, this is awful. Here comes my, you know, parents come to pick me up, my mom, and our only Ford Pinto, not one of many. And I'd go home sometimes uh, to, with these other kids to, you know, go play at their house. And I had a lot of uh, fun kids. One of my best friends was the ambassador's kid from Kuwait. And his house looked like a hotel. Now, I'm sure there's houses this nice in where we live, but I don't see those houses. And at that time, I, that was, you know, far and crazy. But, but I remember he had a nine-car garage. As you drove into his driveway, it was a big round circle, kind of all, you know, bricked off. It was beautiful with a fountain in the middle. And then right behind was nine cars. And you go in there, there's exotic cars, Rolls Royces, just everything you would imagine that a, an Arab Sikh would, Sheik would have, right? And it was like that. And then, you know, I, I just grew up and I would hear their stories or, or I'd go home and listen to the news. And, and, you know, my dad would say, don't you go to school with, with that, guy, that guy's kid? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, so I would see all these things. And early on, I formed this image of what greatness was. And, and I saw greatness was somebody who was dominant, somebody who was strong, somebody who was just driven, somebody who had the respect of thousands and thousands, somebody who owned enormous quantities of land, somebody with just endless resources, somebody that the cameras would fall around. And in my mind, I said, that, that's great. Boy, these guys are so lucky to have a dad like that, to come from a family like that, to go home to a house like that. You know, you don't have to clean anything up. You ask your valet to do it. Oh, that must be so nice, so sweet to have. And, and I would think inside, you know, someday I would like to have something like that. Maybe I should be a, an Arab diplomat. That would really be great. The American diplomats didn't have things that nice. But the Arabs, boy, they were, they were really great in the 70s. Man, they had everything going for them. I thought, yeah, that would be really, really nice to have. And, and so I began to have this, this model, or this statue of what greatness was. And in my head, I just, you ask me, that's what it is. And I'd come home, and I'd look over at my dad. And my dad was not overimposing. He was not driven. He was a very humble man. He was very quiet. He had a, a, a pleasant sense of humor. Very, very kind. People enjoy being around my dad, but he had nothing. He literally, and when I say he had I literally mean we had a rental, and we were able to live there for a period of time, and you know, you just wonder how much longer, but there we were, and that's how I grew up. And I would immediately say, that's not my dad. My dad's not great. <laughs> that's not great. That's my dad. Here I am. He's a nice guy. But that's great over there. Well, you know what? When you're in high school, that's kind of how it works. Fast forward a few years. And all of a sudden, these kids in, in, I went to school with decided, you know, we had such a good 
high school experience, we should have a reunion. We should get together again. And so it started with social media and everything. And so a couple of decades ago, we all started getting to know each other again and learning about each other and, and seeing each other and contacting each other. And, and I remember one conversation I had with one of these kids that I, I just admired so much, and he himself had kind of replaced his dad. And, I, and I, in that conversation about the good old days, I brought it up again. I said, you know, when you were a kid, you had everything. You were so lucky. He says, man, I wish I, you know, I, now I don't have a life like that, but man, how wonderful to be that way. He says, Greg, what are you talking about? I said, no, you had it all. You had the big house. You had all the news and all the money. You guys take amazing vacations. And he just shook his head. He says, Greg, my dad was a raging alcoholic. He would beat my mother and he would beat us. And I'm like an idiot. You know what I said? Well, did you call the police? That, that was the only response I had, was like blaming the victims, you know, why did you let him beat you? He said, Greg, my dad is a diplomat. He had diplomatic immunity. Yes, my mom would call the police, and as soon as our address would come up, they wouldn't respond. They couldn't do anything. So was, I lived in hell, Greg, and I didn't know that. I mean, these other girls, they were absolutely gorgeous girls, girls that... Now, a lot of you guys are, you know, were, were studs in high school. I was not. <laughs> so when you're like me... There's a lot of girls that you're not allowed to talk to. They just belong to another breed of human being. And, um, you know, and when they walk by, you, you, what you need to do is get into a locker and shut the door because you are so unworthy as they, right? And then as they go by, you open it up, step. That's kind of how it was. And I knew that, and I played along. That's, I agreed with them. I am unworthy, you know, and, and, and I went. And um, but I remember... Time, right? Time changes things. All of a sudden, they didn't seem so unworthy anymore. <laughs> it's like, wow, some people do not age like wine. And, and so now I felt like, you know, I could talk to them, you know? And, and, and I brought that up. I said, man, you guys had it all. You were everything. And, and, and the girl looked at me and she said, well, what are you talking about? Like, I, you know, and I said, well, like your sister, you know, she would get bored at school. And your parents would send her to Belgium for a semester. And another time, your parents sent her to Berlin to go to school. And she just shook her head. She goes, Greg, that's what we told people. But my sister suffered from terrible depression. And she would go to a psychiatric ward. And Greg, can you imagine what the psychiatric wards were like in Brazil in the 70s? They're bad now. It's worse than a prison. And that's where my sister was. She was too embarrassed to tell. And we didn't, my parents didn't know. And you know what? Just a couple weeks after that conversation, that girl committed suicide. The sister that, you know, I thought was in Belgium and Berlin. And then fast forward another year or two, the girl who told that to me committed suicide herself. And through this experience, the life, it does not let up on you. And I began to see that this image that I had of greatness, you know, was disappointing. It wasn't great. And I began to see that sometimes mean people hurt people. And, and sometimes people take more than, than they really need to take. And it deprives other people from having enough. And those people are happy to take it. It's just wrong. I don't like that. And, and that's what I saw these people. And so what I began to see as somebody who was great, I began as I matured, as I got older and reevaluated, well, that's not a great person. And I began to understand why Jesus was a great person. I began to understand why Jesus stood against people like this. That Jesus was a giving person, a life-giving person. Jesus was somebody who went to those who were poor, those who were neglected, those who were forgotten, those who were despised. He went to the people that everybody else would spit on. Jesus went to them and embraced them and loved them. And I began to have a transformation in my life where I began to say, that is a great person. That is a great person. And over time, I began to see, I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like these other people. You know, they're, they're, they, they have this image of greatness for you. And that's it. That's all it is. It's the lights. It, it's the clothes. It's just the image. And I, here I was buying it, hook, like and sinker, like an idiot. They were not great people. Their children were not rising up and calling them great. They were embarrassed. They were ashamed of that kind of behavior. And all the while, I was buying the lie. Meanwhile, I have my dad. And then when I would bring the greatness of Jesus and put it up against my dad, I would say, oh, there's not a lot of difference. 
And I began to really grow in my appreciation and my admiration and my respect for my father, not because of who my father was per se, but because of who he was as a person, his character. And I said, that is a great person. And over the years, I don't hear people talking about all these other people, but I do hear people talking about the effect that my dad had in their lives. Always very humble, always very quiet, always very kind. There's no, you know, stuff written and, and attention. But you know what? Jesus is great. Jesus is great. Who needs the grace of God? Let's ask the question. You know, how does the grace of God change somebody? Go right back to that first question. Who needs the grace of God? People who are not deceived by the great image out there anymore, who have learned, have matured, and are not dumb, but they now see what true greatness is. Jesus is true greatness. That's who needs Jesus. That's who needs the grace of God. People who know that Jesus is great. People who know that they themselves are not great, but they want to be like Jesus. People who want to be like Jesus, because Jesus is great, and this lifespan is very short, and you have very little bit of time to make anything of your life. If you want to be like Jesus, because you know that Jesus is great, you need the grace of God. You need the grace of God. Let me tell you about one of the most amazing human beings in the face of this earth. It's just amazing. If you were to take all the people that have ever lived on the globe, and so there will be many, many billions, right? I don't know, maybe 10, 12 billion people, or seven now, add everybody up who's ever lived. And you were to ask people who understand history, people who are objective, are not biased, and you were to say, who would be the 10 most influential people for the good that have ever lived? The entire span of history. This person would be at least in the top five, at least in the top five. This person. Let me tell you a little bit about his story. His name was Saul, Saul. And Saul was a genius. He was an intellectual genius, and he was driven. And he grew up in a very Zionist home, and he came from a family of privilege and of power. And when he was a young man, he had an image of greatness that put Zionism way out ahead of anything else. And a Zionism that protected the Jewish religion against the, all the oppression they've ever had. And it was, we can read in the Old Testament, Jews have a long history of amazing, amazing leaders that have stood against amazing oppression, strong, horrible oppression. And he saw those men as leaders and he saw those men as great. And he set in his heart and his mind, I want to be like them. Very early in his life, he had that opportunity. Because there was a group of people that he and his greatness realized were stealing from the, from the significance of Zionism, the significance of the Jewish religion, the Jewish heritage. They were, they were uh, weakening it. They were diluting it. And those were this new little band, this little growing group called Christians. Jews themselves, Jews themselves. And Paul said, you guys are hurting our cause of nationalism. And I need to put an end to you. And with great agreement and cooperation, the Jewish leader saw in Saul a young, powerful man who would get rid of those horrible Christians that were diluting the importance of the, the Jewish faith. And they gave Paul a, seven, a 007 a license to kill carte blanche to get rid of. Your job is to get rid of these. We today would call Saul a terrorist. We today would quickly compare Saul to ISIS, somebody who's trying to get rid of Christians. And Saul was very effective. He terrified, terrified the Christians. Terrified Christians. Christians would gather their families when they heard that Saul and his men are coming up. And they would drop everything and flee and just run, never to go home again, to flee, lose everything, but to save their own lives. And there goes Saul into that city. Saul was on his way to find some more Christians up in Damascus. Same exact Damascus. Same roads, same location, same layout of the city that we hear almost every day in the news today that's in the middle of the Civil War. There's Saul and his men going up to Damascus to look for young Christians that are up there. And on his way, Jesus himself appears to Saul 
And now, mind you, Jesus had already raised from the dead at this point. He had already ascended back into heaven. But Jesus himself comes down for this moment and appears to Saul in a great moment of light that scared Saul to death, and it blinded him, blinded his horse. He fell off his horse and fell on the ground. Jesus came over to Saul on the ground, and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, mind you, Saul, Jesus did not ask this as, what did I ever do to you, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? I, I've never done anything. No, no, it wasn't like that at all. It was like, idiot, how stupid can you be? Why are you persecuting? You have a brain. You have brain cells. You have activity in there. How can somebody who should have more knowledge and more ability than this be doing something so stupid, Saul? Why are you persecuting me? And that was a question that made Saul reevaluate everything about his life. That's what woke him up. I am persecuting my own people. I am killing my own people. What is wrong with me? Why are these people who I always thought were great, why are they telling me to kill my own people? What's wrong with these? How could I be like that? What is wrong? And Saul changed 180 degrees, repented from that, and went off to Saudi Arabia for a long period of time to reevaluate his life and start brand new. I'm coming back. He had this come back from, you know, minus 100 with trust with people. He had to somehow finagle his way all the way back. Instead of scaring people to death, he's saying, I'm not here to hurt you anymore. What a long road he had to come back. He had to come back. And this is what Paul says. And you can read about it in uh, 1 Corinthians. You want to turn there again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is what, this is what Paul, uh, he changed his name during this time to, to give himself a new identity. Uh, just like some of you, he was very good at branding. <laughs> and so that, that's kind of how that happened. So in 1 Corinthians, you can uh, begin there uh, with verse 9. And this is what... Uh, what Paul says, for I am the least of the apostles. He said, in comparison to all of the others who have seen Jesus and who are leaders in the Christian church, I am the least of them, and I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. I don't even deserve it because I persecuted the church of God. Paul knew who he was, but look at what he says. Look how he follows up with that. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was not without effect to me. And that's what Paul says. He says, that's how I was. And the only difference between how I was and how I am today is Jesus Christ. It's the grace of God that was given to me. Without the grace of God, I would still be Saul, without a doubt in my mind. There's a great preacher. This has been attributed to, to many, many people. But one story where, where it was used was in Chicago. They're on Michigan Avenue. And it was the, the great preacher, Dwight Moody. And he was walking down uh, Michigan Avenue along with an associate, a pastor of his. And as they're walking along, a man staggers out of a bar. And they notice that it's amazing how this guy's able to stay on his two feet because he's, he's just getting his feet all tangled with each other. And he, he makes it to a light pole and he grabs hold of the light pole and he's he like drunk people do, just kind of swaying around looking things. And he, he decides, well, I can make it to the next light pole. And he, he lets go of the light pole and he's staggering in the street and he didn't make it. He tripped over his own feet and smashed right down into the gutter and it was wet and water sprayed everywhere. And you know what Dwight Mutey said about that guy? He looked at him, and he looked at his associate, and he says, there but for the grace of God goes Dwight Moody. And that Dwight, because Dwight Moody understood something very, very important. That would be me had it not been the grace of God to take hold of my life. That would be me. That's exactly what Paul was saying. And that's why we need to come to God, and that's how we get the grace of God, is when we come to God and recognize our great need for God. And God is the one who gives us his grace that makes that amazing transformation in our lives. It's not of us at all, but it's in that relationship. What's the question that we ask for this sermon series, for this specific sermon? The question is very simple. How does the grace of God change me? How does the grace of God change me? The answer is very simple. The grace of God changes you through the effect of your relationship with Jesus Christ. <laughs> The grace of God changes you through the effect of your relationship with Jesus Christ. 
That's how it is. If you have a living, ongoing, growing relationship with Jesus Christ, his grace will not be without effect in your life. It will not. That's how it works. I had these friends from high school. I met up with them. You know what? It was crazy because we met and we hadn't talked sometimes in decades, but we picked up where we left off. Anybody have experiences like that? It's very common, right? But let me tell you, that's all we did. We had nothing in between. No, nothing else increased. Nothing grew. We picked up where we used to be. Can you imagine if you get married today and you pick up every day not long after you got married and there's no ongoing, there's no growing relationship? You know, it works nice if you haven't seen somebody in a decade, but if you see them every day for a decade, that gets awfully old. What we're talking about, just as in a marriage, just as in any other relationship, our relationship with God needs to be an ongoing, growing relationship with God. That's what it has to be, that ongoing. One of my favorite people in, the, in, in history, and especially in my little world and how I see things, my perspective, is a guy named Hudson Taylor. Now, Hudson Taylor was a young, a young British man. And early on, he felt a call to be a missionary, not in his hometown there outside of London. He felt a call to be a missionary in China. This is in the 1800s. And nobody was going to China to be a missionary. The, 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 the operative word at that point was, if God wants to save the Chinese, God will save the Chinese. <laughs> you can just trust God to do the right. You don't have to go there to do that. God will do that. But somehow or another, God said something very different to Hudson Taylor. And he went to China as a young man to win Chinese people to Jesus. When my dad, who was a missionary to Brazil, went, you know what my dad did? He went, but he didn't change much. <laughs> you could see how Brazilians dressed, and then you'd see how my dad dressed. Today, you can go all over the world, and you see how American missionaries dress, or missionaries from all over the world, and you can see how the people there dress. Very few people don't change. Not so with Hudson Taylor. He literally became Chinese. People would meet Hudson Taylor, a Caucasian, and they wouldn't know that they were talking to a Caucasian. Somehow or another, he took on all the beards, he took on all the expressions, he took on everything. They said his Chinese was flawless. Nobody could tell he wasn't from China. Something happened. The guy just immersed himself into that culture so powerfully that he was able to talk to people one on one as if he had grown up and was born in there. It was just something that God would do. But he talks about a time in his life where he would become frustrated, he'd become angry, or he'd become so discouraged because he saw in himself things that weren't right. And he, and he get, became upset and he said, how can I be discouraged and be an example to these people? How can I have anger in my heart? And how can I be frustrated and then still be able to tell other people about the goodness of Jesus? And that just made him upset. And he had this list. If I'm going to be a good Christian, these are the things I need to do right here. And I'm not doing any of them. When somebody sent him a letter from his childhood, and they sent him a letter, and they didn't know why they wrote it, but God put it on their heart to write the letter. And the letter was very simple. It was everything that Hudson Taylor knew. He just needed to be reminded of it. And he says, if you just abide with Christ, if you abide with Christ... You don't have to strive to be who God wants you to be. Stop trying to be who God wants you to be. Instead, abide with Christ and let Christ put his life in you and you live that life out. No striving, no, just live with Christ. And Hudson Taylor says that was so monumental in his life, it completely changed everything that he thought. No more was he going down this list of this is what it means to be like Jesus <laughs> because I've tried to go down that list. Oh, <laughs> what a nightmare experience that is. Have you tried to go down that list? I have. You can't do it. You can't do it. it it's like a mask. <laughs> I can come, I can pretend I'm living like Christ. And as long as you don't get to know me very well at all, <laughs> you might be deceived. But boy, you get to know me a little bit or, or a long period of time, you see the same thing. He just goes, ah, Christian, you're not a Christian. He's like everybody else. Because of what? I'm trying to keep a list. I'm trying to keep a list that's not reflective of who I really am. Let me bring you over to what Jesus says about this very thing. It's a beautiful and a powerful thing. If Jesus were going to share something in our church, he would have to drive up Aborn. And as he's driving up Aborn, he would see the exact same things you and I see. He would see these little decorative vineyards. 
And Jesus would say, oh, good, I don't have to come up with a new sermon illustration. They know what vineyards are at the point. That's easy. And he would come in and he would give a story about a vineyard. And in what he would say there in uh, John chapter 15 is something that some of us are very familiar with. He would say, you know, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. What is he saying? He's saying if you remain with Jesus and keep that relationship going, you are going to bear fruit. What kind of fruit? Wealth, fame, greatness? No, no, no. You are going to bear the fruit that creates in you a Christ-likeness just by being with Jesus. And by being with Jesus, this is what I mean very simply. What I mean is this. When you get up in the mornings, you give priority to God's Word. You open up God's Word. I suggest that you start, if you haven't started already, start in the New Testament. Start with Matthew. Don't go to the Old Testament because the Old Testament is about Jesus. And until you know who Jesus is, you're not going to understand the Old Testament because it's describing somebody you don't know, you won't recognize. But as soon as you learn about Jesus, you'll understand what they're saying in the Old Testament about Jesus. And that's what the Old Testament is. You can't understand the Old Testament without understanding Jesus. So learn about Jesus. You start there in the, Old Test in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, wherever you want to start, and start learning about Jesus. And you might ask, well, how much do I have to read? No, there's no to-do list. There's no length. There's any. This is what you have to do. You've got to read until or you find something that you've learned about Jesus. What's something about Jesus, number one? And number two, what is he asking me to do? So what do I now know about Jesus? What I've been reminded about Jesus, and what am I being asked to do? Very simple. That's how you do it. I would do that in the morning, and you do that at night. And if you can throughout the day, do that again. But remember those. Always put God and try to live in that relationship. Live in that relationship. And what you will start to notice is that relationship begins to bear fruit in you and you become fruitful. Fruitful in the sense of you become like Jesus, more like Jesus. You have the character and the nature and the selflessness and the sinlessness that Christ has. And what you begin to do, you begin to, to see things out there. And, and people will tell you, oh, this is really great. This is really important. But you have been with Jesus that morning. And you were in Jesus just that the night before. And now you're looking at what everybody else is pointing at. You're saying, oh, that's not great. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's not great because I'm looking over at Jesus. I was just with Jesus. And so I'm very familiar with what Jesus is and who Jesus is. And I can tell you right now, this has nothing to do with Jesus. <laughs> And that's where it begins. And that's where it begins. And that's where that growth begins. You begin to recognize inside of you, you know, the difference between true greatness and a fraud of greatness. An image, a game, a, a scheme of greatness. You begin to see who Jesus is. And that's where it goes. Now, but, but look here. Look at the warning he gives you. But if you do not remain in me, if you do not remain, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Now, why would that be? Just think about it. Leaves need nutrients. They need the nutrients from the soil. They need the nutrients from water principally. And they need that, that so the photosynthesis can come in and make them do something. If you cut off the source of life to that branch, to those leaves, they don't have it. And they just curl up in on themselves and dry themselves out. They dry themselves out. They keep giving where there's nothing coming in. <laughs> it's just physics 101, <laughs> laws of thermodynamics. <laughs> you're not creating energy. It's there. You're not creating unless you have it coming in. It's not self-perpetuating. And that's how the Christian is. So if you don't have that, what happens? You're like a branch that is thrown away, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's what you have which is just about what every human being on this planet who doesn't have the grace of God has. That's how they have it. That's who they are. So here's the question. Here's the question. The first question is, who needs grace? How do I get it? You get it by being connected with, through that relationship with Jesus Christ and an ongoing growing relationship. Number three, how do I work the grace of God? How does the grace of God work in my life? You keep that connection. And look at what the Bible says. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, there, see that? So you are coming and you're listening for God, what God wants to tell you. And you are speaking to God in your prayers to God. So you have that relationship going on. What happens? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Say, what? That's crazy. 
It's saying, ask whatever you wish. It's saying, ask whatever you wish. Remember again, it's not saying that to the guy who has an image of greatness to be, you know, somebody who all the lights and cameras are. No, no. It's saying that to the person who lives with Christ, who knows that Christ is the great one, who knows who wants to be like Christ and have the attitude and the character and the selflessness of Christ, who has the love of Christ, who has the disposition. That's, that's who we're talking about. In anything in that world, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Can you believe that's what God wants to do for you? Isn't that amazing? Ask whatever you wish. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves. That you bear, see, that's God. God wants you to be filled with his grace. God wants you to be like Jesus. God wants you to have his character. It's to his Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be his disciples. How do we know we're disciples of Jesus? When our character, when our nature shows us who we value, who we think is great. When you put us up against Jesus, there's not a whole lot of difference. When you put us up to Jesus, and by living in the vine and remaining in the vine, that's how it is. Now, let me tell you the difference. This is very important. Very, very, very important. Let me tell you this. This is the difference between a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with anybody else in this world. A relationship with anybody else in this world is exhausting. It takes from you. It's hard. It's draining. You've got to have something. You've got to psych yourself up to give in any human relationship. That's how human relationships are. They're hard. They're draining. They're exhausting. You wither up, right? How's a relationship with Jesus? completely different. A relationship with Jesus is this. You come into a relationship with Jesus, you are the drain. <laughs> you are the one who's sucking the life out of that bond. You are the one. Jesus is the one giving, 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 pouring into you, refreshing you, filling you up. That's who Jesus is. That's the relationship with Jesus. When Jesus gives, 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 that's why we can come into a relationship with other people and we are not sucking the life out of them. We are pouring life into them because we have an endless source of life in Jesus. That's the difference. And that's the life of the Christian. And that's when God calls us. How does God's grace change a life? God's grace changes a life when you recognize your deep need for it. God's grace changes it when you know where that life comes from, where that grace comes from, that the effects of the relationship with God, an ongoing, growing relationship with God. And how do I work that relationship? Two small things. So I want to close with number one, believe that God will do what he says he's going to do. If God says he's going to change your heart, if God says he's going to change your life, if God says he's going to change everything about you, believe it for because he said it. Know that we don't have any doubt that that's what God's going to do, or at least believe it enough to go one more step into it. Believe what God's going to said He's going to do. He's going to do. And if God can, if you can believe that God can change your heart and He can help you overcome your addiction to pornography, He can help you overcome your, your over sexualized life. If He can help you overcome your your addictions to, to to gambling and to alcohol and to drugs or anything else, if God can overcome and take that anger outside of your heart, that lack of forgiveness that you had against people, that resentment or, or that terrible pride that you have of striving to control other people, whatever it might be. If you know that God can change your heart and you say, God can change my heart, your heart will be changed if you allow the grace of God to touch your heart and touch your life. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is where I'm going to put it back in your court, do you recognize your deep need for it? Do you recognize your deep need for it? Because in the measure that you think, you can go find a to-do list and train yourself and change your mind and change your thinking and start doing all these things, you're not going to have the grace of God. <laughs> you're not going to have the grace of God. It, comes, it does not come to the person who thinks they can do it, who thinks they can fake it, who thinks they can become It's not going to happen. I'll tell you right now. We got 2,000 years of history of people trying. They fail on their face. But if you are on your face, if you're on the ground because you've learned that lesson, I can't do it. And you stand up and you look to Jesus and you begin saying, I can't do it. And you say, I am. I'm going to put you in first place. I'm going to start being in the vine. I'm going to get connected to that source of life giving. I'm going to go find that. And I'm going to go make that a priority in my life. And that's where I'm going to live. Boy, watch out. <laughs> it's going to come pouring in. It's going to surprise you. 
Let me tell you what, your dreams are not God's dreams. Let me tell you that, right? Your dreams are not God's dreams. Your dreams are this big, okay? God's dreams are the Pacific Ocean. God's dream comes, God comes to you and he says, nah, yeah, I know this is what you think is a good life, but let me show you what is a good life. And sometimes we say, well, well, God, this is getting hard. Oh, you better believe it's getting hard because you're scared to death what God's going to lead you through. And that's the life of a Christian. God brings you to the brink. He says, hey, let's keep going. Let's keep going. You will learn so much about God's faithfulness and God's goodness in your life. Boy, you're going to grow like you've never seen. That's what the Bible says over and over. And that's what the Christian life testifies in, in millions of different cases, in millions of different examples, but it all starts here. Do you believe that God can do what he says he's going to do in your heart? You believe he can change your heart? Number two, number two, do you need him to do it? Do you, are you at that point where you recognize that you are that person stumbling out of the bar and falling into the gutter and making everything splash? Do you recognize that you are that person who has that, that image of greatness as just a fraud? Do you recognize that? Do you recognize that, that if somebody were to put the image of Jesus next to you, that if they thought that you were somewhat like that, you would pity them because they're misguided, they're misinformed, they don't know you very well? Is that you? Are you somebody who says, but I'm not. I'm not like that. I haven't been able to trick anybody else and much less myself i need jesus i need something real to happen in my heart i need something real to happen in my life. and i'm willing to pay that price and i'm willing to give that priority of stepping into the relationship that growing ongoing relationship with jesus if that's you if that's you let this moment be a life change a history change in your life a destiny change in your life let you be here today you say yes jesus Yes, Jesus, I need you, and I believe you can change my heart. I believe you can change my life. So you too will say, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace was not without effect on me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, here we have your people, Lord. We just stand here as equals, as one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread. Heavenly Father, that's what we do. We stand here under your presence and in your presence and with you. Lord, I want to thank you for your history with each individual who is standing here today and how you have called them to yourself and how you are moving them forward in this life. And that this life is not hopeless and helpless and desperate, but this life is filled with life, filled with life in abundance because of our connection to being with the vine where that life just flows into us. Heavenly Father, I pray for an anointing upon each person here today. And Lord, I ask that as we sing this next song, a song of worship and praise to you, a song that acknowledges and affirms who you are, that your Holy Spirit would touch, your Holy Spirit would embrace, that you would love the people, Lord, as only you can love each individual and guide them, Father, guide them forward, guide them forward, Father. Lord, do this, we pray. In your name, amen.